19th century and in the Middle Ages, that a sovereign ruler cannot be bound by the acts of his predecessors. It is of the essence of infallibility, as the doctrine was formulated at Vatican I, that the infallible decrees of one pope are binding on all of his successors since they are, by definition, irreformable. The point is not presented as a mere verbal equivocation. Real issues of ecclesiastical power are involved. If the popes have always been infallible in any meaningful sense of the word, if their official pronouncements as heads of the church on matters of faith and morals have always been unerring and so irreformable, then all kinds of dubious consequences ensue. Most obviously, 20th century popes would be bound by a whole array of past papal decrees reflecting the responses of the Roman Church to the religious and moral problems of former ages. As Acton put it, the responsibility for the acts of the buried and repented past would come back at once and forever. To defend religious liberty would be insane, and to persecute heretics commendable. Judicial torture would be licit, and the taking of interest on loans a mortal sin. The Pope would rule by divine right. Not only the universal church, but the whole world. Unbaptized babies would be punished in hell for all eternity. Maybe the sun would still be going around the earth. All this is impossible, of course. No one understands the fact better than the modern theologians of infallibility. If past popes have always been infallible, again, we must add, in any meaningful sense of the word, then present popes are hopelessly circumscribed in their approaches to all the really urgent moral problems of the 20th century. Problems involving war, sex, scientific progress, state power, social obligations, and individual liberties. The existence of this dilemma helps to explain the rather eccentric development of the doctrine of infallibility during the past century. Since Vatican Council I, Catholic theologians have felt obliged to defend some form of papal infallibility. Real infallibility has re regrettable implications. In the years since 1870, therefore, theologians have devoted much ingenuity to devising a sort of pseudo-infallibility for the Pope, a kind of Pickwickian infallibility. Their usual technique has been to raise endless, teasing, really unanswerable questions about the meaning of the term ex cathedra as used in the decree of Vatican Council I and about the phrases ordinary magisterium and extraordinary magisterium that came to be associated with it in discussions on papal infallibility. Already in 1874, Gladstone could write, quote, There is no established or accepted definition of the phrase ex cathedra, and the Catholic has no power to obtain one, and no guide to direct him in his choice among some twelve theories on the subject, which, it is said, are bandied to and fro among Roman theologians, except the despised and discarded agency of his private judgment, end quote. Things have not improved since. To be sure, modern apologists often insist that the conditions needed to guarantee the infallibility of a papal pronouncement were set out once and for all, simply and clearly in the decree of Vatican I, Vatican Council I. But then they find it impossible to agree as to which particular papal pronouncements actually satisfy these supposedly simple and clear requirements. There is no authoritative or agreed list of the infallible pronouncements made before 1870. The uncertainty as to what is and what is not infallible extends to papal declarations touching the most fundamental issues of public and private morality. Concerning the syllabus of Pope Pius IX, for instance, the Catholic Encyclopedia declared in 1912, quote, Many theologians are of the opinion that to the syllabus as such an infallible teaching authority must be ascribed. Others question this, end quote. The New Catholic Encyclopedia recording the theological progress of half a century, tells us that things remained exactly the same in 1967. The one papal definition made since 1870, which has been commonly accepted as infallible, is Pope Pius XII's proclamation of the dogma of the Assumption. But if, in due course, Catholic theologians find it is desirable to retreat from the view that this late-blooming dogma forms an intrinsic part of the Christian faith, there will be no lack of theological argumentation devoted to proving that Pius XII, in spite of his best efforts, did not succeed in making an infallible pronouncement after all. The one consistent rule of interpretation we can be sure of encountering is this. Whenever a theologian disagrees with some old teaching or new ruling of a pope, he will find good theological grounds for deciding that the papal pronouncement was not infallible. 
The whole modern doctrine of infallibility in its Pickwickian form might be summed up in the general principle. All infallible decrees are certainly true, but no decrees are certainly infallible. To be sure, this is not the only position open to a contemporary Catholic theologian. During the 1950s, Pope Pius XII's encyclical Humani Generis stirred a strange eddy of controversy in academic theological circles. In this document, the Pope declared, quote, It is not to be thought that the matters proposed in encyclical letters do not in themselves command assent, because in encyclicals the pontiffs do not exercise the supreme power of their magisterium. For these things are taught by the ordinary magisterium, to which also the words apply, He who hears you, hears me. Pope Pius's reference to the authority of the ordinary magisterium led some theologians to insist once again that the decree of Vatican Council I actually meant what it said, that the Pope was infallible whenever he pronounced on matters of faith and morals in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians. The difficulty in this position is that the pronouncements of popes, even modern popes, sometimes contradict one another, notably, for example, in the matter of religious toleration. Some theologians, therefore, have upheld the infallibility of contemporary decrees without giving serious consideration to the possibility of their conflicting with preceding ones. In effect, they are content to pretend that the past did not happen. There is at least a beguiling innocence in this approach. Other theologians, more reprehensibly from a historian's point of view, have devised hermeneutical principles so ingenious that the documents of the past can never embarrass them. By applying such principles, they can reinterpret any doctrinal pronouncement, re regardless of its actual content, to mean whatever the modern theologian thinks it, that its framers ought to have meant. The infallible doctrine of the past remains infallible, but it is deprived of all objective content. This procedure seems based on a kind of Alice in Wonderland logic. One is reminded of the Cheshire Cat, Cheshire Cat, the body of a past pronouncement disappears, but its grin of infallibility persists. The general principle underlying the second major approach to the problem of infallibility might be summarized in the formula. Quote, all infallible pronouncements are irreformable until it becomes convenient to change them. End quote. It seems only fair to add that most Catholic theologians have continued to opt for some version of the relatively simple and straightforward Pickwickian position. By the time of Vatican Council II, the, ca the Catholic theology of infallibility had become a tangle of paradoxes and evasions. The theologians had worked themselves into a complicated cul-de-sac, but the Council refrained from any thoroughgoing reconsideration of this question and merely repeated with minor variations the doctrine of 1870. In the years since Vatican II, however, a new development of thought has occurred. Very recently, while this book was being written, a few Catholic scholars have begun overtly, challenge, overtly to challenge the validity of the doctrine that was defined at Vatican Council I and reaffirmed at Vatican Council II. It remains to be seen whether their point of view will establish itself as a viable position that can be held within the Roman Catholic Church. Fortunately, for the purpose of the present work, we shall not need to pursue in more detail the intricacies of contemporary apologetics and hermeneutics. A historian cannot do the theologians' work for them. He cannot show them how to get out of their cul-de-sac. It is enough, perhaps, if he can show them how they got into it in the first place. In this book, therefore, we shall be concerned with the historical origins of the doctrine of infallibility. We have begun by emphasizing the paradoxes of modern theology because it is impossible to understand the history of infallibility without some awareness of those paradoxes. The central point is that to attribute infallibility to a whole line of rulers is to curtail radically the sovereign power of each individual monarch, since each monarch is bound by the infallible decrees of his predecessors. Yet, perversely, it may seem, modern partisans of the doctrine of papal infallibility have always wanted to increase the power of the reigning pope, hence their paradoxes and evasions. Historians of infallibility have started out from the same mistaken assumptions as the theologians. They have always assumed that the first advocates of a doctrine of papal infallibility must necessarily have been ardent defenders of absolute papal power. They are sometimes a little puzzled that they do not find infallibility proclaimed in the writings of the extreme papalists of the High Middle Ages, men like Giles of Rome, James of Viterbo, Henry of Cremona, Augustinus Triumphus, in fact, the presuppositions that historians have commonly brought to the consideration 
of this question render the whole early history of papal infallibility unintelligible. The truth is that earliest defenders of the doctrine were much more interested in limiting the power of the Pope than in enhancing it. Our central theme will be the emergence of the doctrine of papal infallibility in the years around 1300. It is impossible, however, to pursue the history of infallibility as an isolated concept. Both in its medieval development and in its modern expression, the idea of infallibility is so interwoven with the ideas of sovereignty and of ecclesiastical tradition that we have had to pay some attention to those subjects also. We have already mentioned one relevant aspect of the concept of sovereignty, the doctrine that a sovereign ruler is not bound by his predecessors. The other aspect, which is important for our theme, relates to the location of ultimate authority in the church as between pope and general council. The partisans of papal infallibility of Vatican Council I were anxious to demolish once and for all the doctrine that a general council was greater than a pope in matters of faith. Accordingly, the decree on papal infallibility enacted in 1870 contained a clause explicitly denying that a Catholic could appeal from a pope to a general council as to a superior authority. This problem has its roots in the 12th century canon law, and we shall need to give some consideration to it. The concept of tradition is at least as complex as the concept of sovereignty. Nowadays, Catholic theologians agree that revealed truth is known to us through scripture and tradition. There are, however, various ways of understanding this duality. It is possible to assert that all the essential truths of faith are contained in the Old and New Testaments, and that the tradition is, so to speak, a perpetual mediation of the church on scripture a continuing activity that makes ever more explicit the implicit truths, the Holy Writ. Since the Council of Trent, Catholic theologians have more commonly maintained that truths of faith exist which are not to be found in Scripture at all, but which were transmitted orally by Christ to the apostles and by the apostles to the church. In either case, there is an ambiguity inherent in the word tradition itself. Normally, if we wish to determine whether a given doctrine or practice was traditional, we should inquire whether it did actually exist in earlier times. But this normal usage by no means exhausts the theological implications of the word tradition. Theologians like to speak of living tradition. They point out that in handing down a tradition from age to age, the church constantly enriches that tradition. They insist that tradition is a principle of growth, not of stagnation. Some theologians, when they refer to living tradition, mean to assert essentially the same principle that Newman discussed when he wrote of development of doctrine. Others go much further. They see no need to trace out any process of historical development in defining the tradition of the church. The faith of the church, they hold, is unchanging. Therefore, any doctrine currently taught by the church is necessarily a part of the church's perennial tradition. The point was put crisply by Dinefe in the phrase, quote, Tradition is the church teaching. End quote. In the most extreme form, this doctrine identifies tradition solely and simply with the teaching of the church's official, official magisterium, or even of the pope's, or even of the pope alone, at any given moment. Critics of the doctrine suggest that it opens the way to unbridled innovation in the sphere of church doctrine, for each new declaration can be presented without reference to scripture, as an implicit, even if hitherto unheard of part of the undefined doctrine enshrined in tr the tradition of the church. The teaching that infallible pronouncements can apply only to an initial deposit of a divine revelation it is no obstacle to innovation when the act of definition itself is sufficient to establish that a given doctrine was indeed part of the deposit. Whether or not Pio Nono actually said, quote, la tradizione sonio, such ideas played a significant part in the movement of thought leading up to dogmatic decree, leading up to the dogmatic decree of 1870. The modern ideas of tradition have medieval antecedents. We shall need to explore them in some detail if we are to understand the 13th century origins of the doctrine of papal infallibility. The history of infallibility as distinct from its theology has attracted little attention among modern scholars. In most standard treatments, the theme one encounters only long lists of texts from scripture, patristic writings, medieval and modern theologians, all presented in chronological order but without any meaningful historical context. This is true even of the best modern account of medieval ideas on infallibility, that of Paul de Vaux. According to the defenders of papal infallibility, the texts cited show that the doctrine has been held since the very beginning of the church, at least implicitly. 
Everyone agrees that papal infallibility was not explicitly asserted in the age of the fathers. According to opponents of the doctrine, the texts in question, or at any rate the earlier ones, have no such implication. To trace connections between pure ideas in a historical vacuum is an interesting pursuit, and it can be rewarding for philosophers and theologians, but a historian ignores a whole dimension of existence if he forgets that ideas are rooted in real life. We have tried, therefore, to bear in mind the admonition of Hudbert Jeddon. To understand ecclesiology, we must orient ourselves primarily to the facts of church history. The doctrine of papal infallibility was not overtly proclaimed by the early councils and fathers of the church. It did not emerge imperceptibly, as if out of nowhere, in the long centuries of the Middle Ages. The doctrine was created as a the doctrine was created at a particular point in time to meet the needs of particular persons and groups in the church. Franciscan theologians, we shall find, played a major role in the interplay of ideas and events that we shall try to explain. Hence, in order to understand their positions, we shall need to discuss some of the special problems that face the Franciscan order from the mid-13th century onward. Although the history of the doctrine of infallibility has been rather neglected by recent scholars, the subject revealed its fair share of attention in the controversies of 1870. Then, two general lines of argument emerged, which we can illustrate in their more extreme forms from the polemical writings of Manning and Dollinger. Manning maintained that the doctrine of papal infallibility had been held by the church from its first foundation. Among scriptural texts, he emphasized especially Luke 22:32. I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith shall not fail. According to Manning, the stability of the faith of the Roman see was acknowledged by the fathers from the time of Irenaeus onward. He insisted particularly on the formula of Pope Hormistas, 514-523, quote, in the apostolic see, religion has always been preserved without stain, end quote, and on the similar formula of Pope Agatho, 678 and 681, Quote, this apostolic see will never be convicted of erring from the path of apostolic tradition, end quote. Naturally, Manning did not neglect to point out that this second formula was accepted by the Sixth General Council of the Church. Manning conceded that none of the texts that he produced from the first 15 centuries of the Church's history actually asserted that the Pope was infallible. What they proved, he maintained, was that the Church had constantly acted on the assumption that this was the case, the doctrine of papal infallibility was in possession down to the time of the Council of Constance. It was never challenged before the 15th century. That is the reason, according to Manning, why we find the doctrine overtly stated and defended only from the 15th century onward. Manning was really relying on an argument from silence, though he sharply attacked Dollinger for using the same kind of argument in a contrary sense. Quote, the thought that either the see or successor of Peter could fail in faith is not to be found in those thousand years from the 5th century to the 15th century, he wrote. For Manning, the fact that the doctrine of infallibility was not denied in the early church proved that it was universally accepted. For Dollinger, on the other hand, the silence of the early fathers and councils concerning papal infallibility established beyond doubt that the doctrine was utterly alien to the primitive church. Quote, up to the time of the Isidorian forgeries, no serious attempt was made anywhere to introduce the neo-Roman theory of infallibility. The popes did not dream of laying claim to such a privilege, end quote. Dollinger attributed the subsequent growth of the doctrine to, quote, forgeries and fictions, end quote. He emphasized especially a text of the pseudo-Isidorian forgeries of the mid-9th century. Quote, the Roman church remains to the end free from the stain of heresy, end quote. Misled by such forgeries, later popes and canonists pr propounded wildly exaggerated theories of papal power. Pope Gregory the Twelfth wait, Pope Gregory, sorry, Pope Gregory the Seventh in particular must have held the Pope Gregory the Seventh in particular, quote, must have held the prerogative of infallibility the most precious jewel of his crown, end quote. Dollinger traced the influence of the pseudo-Isidorian forgeries through the, the canonistic collections of Dustidit, Anselm of Lucca, and Burchard of Worms to the Decretum of Gratian in 1140. 
Gratian's book was a massive work of synthesis whose appearance marked the beginning of a new era in the history of the church law, in the history of church law. Dollinger correctly observed that it, quote, displaced all the other collections of canon law and became the manual and repertory, not for canonists only, but for the scholastic theologians, end quote. He seems to have regarded its influence as wholly baneful. According to Dollinger, the doctrine of papal infallibility was firmly established in the canonical literature of the church by the mid-12th century. Down to the 13th century, however, dogmatic theology remained unaffected by the canonist theory, for the theologians hardly ever wrote on problems of papal power in their technical treaties. It was Thomas Aquinas, according to Dollinger, who, quote, made the doctrine of the pope a formal part of dogmatic theology, end quote. Seeking for arguments against the Greeks, he turned to the forged text of Gratian and other more recent forgeries. The effect of his work was to introduce, quote, the doctrine of the Pope and his infallibility into the dogmatic system of the Scola, end quote. There would be little point in our retracing, this st retracing step by step all of the weary arguments of the 19th century polemicists about the significance of the text referring to papal authority in the early church. But it is necessary to note at the outset that neither of the two sharply opposed positions that we have presented, nor any subsequent variation of them, provides an acceptable account of the historical origins of papal infallibility. Manning's version of the argument from silence may seem as irrefutable as it is unconvincing. But after all, the silence of the early church was not altogether unbroken. The scripture text most commonly cited in favor of papal infallibility is Luke 22.32, there is no lack of patristic commentary on the text. None of the fathers interpret it as meaning that Peter's successors were infallible. No convincing argument has ever been put forward explaining why they should not have stated that the text implied a doctrine of papal infallibility if that is what they understood it to mean. Again, it is difficult for us to know exactly what men of the 6th and 7th centuries understood by formulas like those of Hormistas and Agatho. But we do know that the general council which accepted Agatho's formula also anathematized Agatho's predecessor, Pope Honorius, on the ground that he, quote, followed the views of the heretic Sergius and confirmed his impious dogmas, end quote. Agatho's successor, Pope Leo II, in confirming the decrees of the council, added that Honorius, quote, did not illuminate the apostolic see by, by teaching the apostolic tradition, but by an act of treachery strove to subvert its immaculate faith, end quote. Whatever the council fathers may have meant by the formula they accepted concerning the unfailing faith of the apostolic see, their meaning can have had little connection with the modern doctrine of papal infallibility. We shall see that, in the 12th and 13th centuries also, the ecclesiological doctrines derived from such formulas were quite different from those of the 19th century ultramontanes. Dollinger's argument is no more convincing than Manning's. The fundamental objection to his account is that it is based on a radical misunderstanding of the canonical tradition of the medieval church. Dollinger was anxious to prove that the doctrine of papal infallibility originated in 9th century forgeries, but this led him to apply a kind of double standard in his interpretation of canonical texts. When dealing with genuine patristic writings, Dollinger always used the argument from silence in a negative sense. Since the doctrine of papal infallibility was not explicitly affirmed, it was taken to be implicitly denied. But when he dealt with forged texts, Dollinger was quite willing to see papal infallibility implied even though it was not explicitly asserted, and in this interpretation he was very probably wrong. It is by no means clear that any of the forgers or the popes and canonists who accepted their texts, the men whom Dollinger regarded as the originators of the doctrine of papal infallibility, actually embraced any such doctrine. A modern historian cannot exclude the possibility that some eccentric or prescient pope or canonist in the 9th, 10th, or 11th century may have secretly cherished in his heart the dogma of 1870. The point cannot be proved one way or the other. What can be proved is that no public teaching affirming the infallibility of the Pope was transmitted to the canonists of the 12th and 13th centuries, in whose works, for the first time, abundant texts for the, for the investigation of this whole question became, become available. The commenters on Gratian's Decretum knew all the most important texts, genuine and forged, relating to the authority of the Pope and the indefectibility of the Roman Church. 
they did not associate those texts with any doctrine of papal infallibility. They showed no awareness that any of their predecessors had ever associated them with such a doctrine. We shall argue that the theologians of the 13th century could not possibly have taken the doctrine of papal infallibility from the canonical tradition of the church because the doctrine simply did not exist in the writings of the canonists. An investigation of the thought of, of an investigation of the thought of the medieval canonists provides the necessary starting point for work on the origins of papal infallibility and the ideas associated with it. De Dollinger thought that the canonists were primarily responsible for creating the doctrine of infallibility itself. Other, more recent scholars have seen the canonists as the originators of various modern ideas concerning ecclesiastical tradition. And certainly the canonists' works influenced all subsequent writings on papal sovereignty. Moreover, on one important point, Dollinger was entirely correct. Early scholastic theologians offered almost no discussions on the structure of the church. In the 12th century, the whole field of study that we call ecclesiology was regarded as a province of ecclesiastical jurisprudence. If then, we are to understand the medieval church's conception of its own nature and structure in the century before the emergence of the doctrine of papal infallibility, we must turn first to the writings of the decretists and the decretalists.